if you want to be a good combat sport athlete, you need to spar. At least that's what we've thought. But recently, fighters in MMA, boxing, and Muay Thai have been challenging this notion. Spar anymore? That's real? Yeah, don't spar. And because of the harsh effects fighting can have on your brain, it seems like less sparring might have some big upside. So can you get good at fighting without sparring? Or is there a better balance that will keep you sharp in the ring, but also mentally after you decide to hang up the gloves? The first thing that's important to know is what are we actually talking about when we say brain damage in combat sports or contact sports? Well, brain damage in almost all combat sports and contact sports is called CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And what CTE is, is a progressive degenerate brain disease, which means it essentially makes the matter in your brain smaller. And what this can do is lead to memory loss, difficulty controlling emotion, and this decay can even lead to dementia. And even though the disease has only been studied for the last 15 years or so, researchers are very confident that the only way to develop CTE is through repeated trauma to the head. So as you can imagine, if you do combat sports, you're definitely within a group that is at risk of developing CTE. The issue with our understanding about CTE, however, is that we don't have as much clear data as you may think. The reason this is the case is because CTE is only diagnosable post-mortem or after the patient has died and you can actually look at their brain. So when you hear media talk about players who currently have CTE who are actually active in the NFL or other sports leagues, they're typically basing this off of the symptoms that they can observe. And the issue with this is that players may develop symptoms of CTE without actually having the brain disease, and that can lead to some faulty data. But despite these limitations, what do we actually know about CTE? Well, we know for certain that the most important factor in someone developing CTE or not is having repeated trauma to the head. There are plenty of recorded cases of people getting one or two terrible concussions but never developing CTE. Think about pro athletes like skateboarders or professional skiers. Many of these people are at high risk of developing concussions at some point in their career, but at a very low risk of developing CTE. So this suggests that being hit repeatedly is more likely to develop CTE than being hit harder fewer times. To see this point in action, we have to look no further than the NFL. In the NFL, the positions that are most likely to develop CTE are the linemen, both offensive and defensive. And if you've watched American football, you know that the linemen are not being hit the hardest. But even though they're not getting hit the hardest, their heads are making contact with the other players almost every single play. But even though those blows are typically sub-concussive, they do enough damage over time to lead to CTE. So you may be wondering, how does the brain actually even get damaged in the first place? Well, brain damage is actually a fairly simple explanation. But to understand this, we need to understand a little bit more about anatomy. The human skull encapsulates your brain, but inside of that layer before your brain is actually a layer of fluid around it. So your brain is essentially floating within your skull. So what happens when you get punched or hit with a helmet in football is all of that force is sent through your brain, through your skull, and if you're hit hard enough, that will send your brain through the fluid into the side of your skull wall. And if you're hit hard enough, your brain will sometimes ricochet within your skull. On a side note, that's why helmets and headgear in boxing are actually not very effective at preventing CTE because it's your brain hitting your skull, not the external force hitting your brain. So I know this all sounds bad, but we can actually use a lot of this information to train hard and stay safe at the same time long term. When it comes to sparring, there are four changes that you can make right now that will significantly reduce the chances of you developing CTE. The first is limit your hard sparring. When you hard spar, almost every punch you throw has a high likelihood of being powerful enough to cause some sort of head trauma. So let's just say you throw 100 punches. 80 of those punches could be significant enough to do damage to your brain. When you light spar, you pull your punches and a significant amount of those punches will not do any significant damage. So even if that number only drops to 50 out of those 100 punches being worthy enough of head trauma, you are still at a 40% less likelihood of developing head trauma from that sparring session. And trust me, in light sparring, that number could be a lot fewer than 50, but over time, even if it is 50, that number will save you a lot of head trauma over the course of a year and over the course of a career. Now, of course, sparring does have its place, and hard sparring will teach you certain lessons that nothing else can, but limit it as much as you can. The second tip is think about defense. A lot of times when new beginners get into the ring in boxing or MMA or kickboxing, they want to hit somebody, and that is their only goal. And what that sacrifices is a defensive game plan. And what you'll often see is people take a lot of punishment, especially early on. So what you can do to avoid CTE is getting hit less. Think about defense. Think about how to not get hit because every single good fighter you know they're not amazing at just hitting people, they're amazing at not getting hit. And that is typically what makes people levels above their competition. So one, if you want to be good at fighting, 
thing about defense, but another benefit will be getting hit less and lowering the chances of you developing any sort of brain injury. The third tip is use sparring as an appropriate tool. If you have a bad jab on the pads, you don't need to fix that with sparring. So many coaches use sparring as this panacea cure-all tool when their fighter doesn't do what they need to be doing. If your problem is specific to sparring or fighting where you cannot emulate this with a drill or with a lighter way to do it, then sparring could be an appropriate tool to use to actually improve a fighter. But so many times there will be things people can work on outside of the ring that will keep them safer, but instead coaches will throw their fighters headfirst into sparring. A pretty common example I see is fighters being pretty bad at defense, and then what happens is their coach says, all right, you need to spar more, but they've never worked on defense, they don't know how to be good on defense, they don't know what they're even trying to do in there, and as a result they get hit more, their coach is frustrated, they feel like they're not improving, and the cycle repeats itself. If you go in there with a little bit of a game plan, do some drills, and then go spar, even if you're working on one or two things, that sparring now has a purpose. So when you spar, make sure you're doing it for a reason. Don't go in there just to do it, like I've said before, because that will lead to you taking unnecessary damage without learning anything, and what's the point of that? The fourth tip I'll give is do Muay Thai play sparring. We do, we do movement sparring now. But like, it's never like... You know, like, you ever watch Thai, thai spar? No. Like, like Thai people? Watch how they spar. It's like real... It's real, like, speed, but it's not power. You know what I mean? Like, we're but not are you to touching each other? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're touching each other here and there. Now, you don't have to do this for just Muay Thai. You can do it for boxing, MMA, or kickboxing. But Muay Thai play sparring is basically where you're touch sparring your opponent. And this is not necessarily going to take you to the next level, but what it will do, especially if you're a beginner, is help you visualize the moves that you're trying to do. I spent four or five months on the pads and on the bag before I ever started sparring and boxing. And what I had a hard time doing when I actually got to the ring is find my range and actually put together combinations on a moving target. So if you can play spar with your friends or with your training partners, you'll start to learn what you're actually trying to do, come up with a little bit of a game plan, work on feints, work on all the little details. And when you actually go into a ring or a sparring session that's a little bit harder, you'll know a little bit more about what you're trying to do and not just hoping something works. But if you really love martial arts and want almost no chance of developing CTE, I highly recommend checking out Jiu-Jitsu. And if you want to hear about my first six months of Jiu-Jitsu, I'll leave that somewhere on the screen. But with that being said, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.